So it's just a short one on parachutes. Um, I think one of the most frequently asked questions we get on the ISC channel is people wanting to know how to calculate what kind of size parachute and type of parachute they should use. And we always sort of individually ask them, so I thought I'd just do a little video explaining how they work. It should be fairly basic, but it hopefully be interesting. Um, so we have a sort of payload, living or otherwise. And um, there's a force acting on it as it falls. Is, um, is a force, the acceleration due to gravity is acting on his mass, uh, which gives you the weight force. And as the, as the payload accelerates down, uh, the, because of the uh, molecules of air impacting him in the other direction, his drag will increase. Um, and what happens is he keeps on accelerating until the drag, until the velocity becomes high enough that the drag is equal to the weight. And at that point, he's in equilibrium. And that determines what is his terminal velocity. Now, if you just take a typical payload or person or whatever, that terminal velocity is quite high. So that's the drag force. Um, so that terminal velocity is quite high and it won't survive. Um, so we try and increase, uh, because drag is proportional to, it, well, it's a function of the velocity and it's a function of the area. If we want the velocity to be much lower when we land, it means we need to increase the drag area a lot. So that's why we do a parachute. <laughs> um, but the important point is that we're trying to achieve an equilibrium condition where the weight is equal to the drag and we're trying to make the velocity at which that happens as low as possible or, or something reasonable like five meters a second. So the basic setup for working this out is weight is equal to drag. Um, we're just going to fill in the actual uh, equation that is saying the same thing. So weight is you've got your mass and you've got the acceleration due to gravity um, acting on that mass, which gives you the weight force. And then the drag is a pressure force, so it's a pressure acting on an area. So you have this term here, which is half times the density of the fluid you're in times the velocity squared. That's called dynamic pressure, and it's a pressure. And this thing is an area. Specifically, A is the area, and CD is the drag coefficient, which is a number that represents how draggy that particular area going into a flow is. And I'll come on to more about that later. Um, just because you should never believe when people throw numbers at you that both these things are forces, we can actually just sanity check it. So we can say mass has units of kilograms, and um, G is, is an acceleration due to gravity, so that has units of meters per second squared. Um, half doesn't have units. Uh, rho is density, which is kilograms per cubic meter. Velocity is meters per second squared, which is meters squared per second squared. Drag coefficient is just a multiplying factor. It doesn't have a unit, and area is meters squared. And if you collect all these terms together uh, and you can cancel out these bits, you get uh, kilogram meters per second squared. So it's, these two are both valid forces. And Wikipedia, as always, confirms that is the unit of force. <laughs> um, so... All we have to do if we want to calculate the velocity that we're going to land at is rearrange this equation just to get a velocity out on its own. So we divide through by a half rho CDA and then square root the whole lot, which is that equation. So that could be the end of my talk, um, but it's not. Um, you actually need to know what some of these numbers are, and that comes down to the actual picking of the parachute. Um, so you can fill in some numbers. G is the, Earth's, the acceleration. Uh, that's actually at the surface of the Earth, 9.81 meters per second. But at 32 kilometers, it's only about a percent lower. It's close enough that you can just treat it as the same thing. Um, the density of the Earth is 1.22 kilograms per cubic meter at sea level, air, and standard conditions. Um, the tricky thing is the drag coefficient. And that's really what a lot of the talk is about, because there's a lot of confusion about drag coefficients with parachutes. Um, even among parachute makers, especially at the sort of hobby end, um, you know, rocket parachutes, there's some very dodgy ones and some very dodgy numbers. Um, so we'll talk a bit about drag coefficient. So what is drag coefficient? Well, both these two shapes have the same frontal area as if you're an air molecule. They both take up the same area in front of you presented to a flow. But we, can intu we intuitively say this is less aerodynamic and this shape is more aerodynamic. We sort of know what we mean by that. And the way we encode that intuition is with a number called drag coefficient CD. So this has a high drag coefficient because it's quite a draggy shape for a given area. This has a low drag coefficient. Um, and it just gives us a way of kind of weighting how the area, if that's, if that's you're getting a lot of drag from the area or not much drag from that area. Um, how does it apply to parachutes? Well, parachutes are obviously, you might think a parachute wants the highest drag coefficient possible, but it's not the case. Here's what happens with a parachute. This, this dotted line is the center line. What happens is you get um, flow coming into the parachute. And because you have high pressure on the inside and low pressure on the outside, the high pressure wants to get to the low pressure side, obviously. And the way it normally does that is you get it spilling out of one side, which causes a, a, a vortex. 
and then spinning out the other side, which causes another vortex, and spinning out the other side, which causes a vortex, and so on. And because parachutes aren't rigid structures, um, if, if the parachute is imparting moments to the airflow, then the airflow, by conservation momentum, is imparting a moment back to the parachute. And the parachute will start flapping side to side. Or in two-dimensional land, it flaps side to side. In 3D land, it will actually start coning. And um, you can see this. This is one of James's flights. I think you're using one of those flat sheet parachutes, which is really bad for this kind of thing. Um, so you can see, you can see um, and his, his, there's a view from another side. Incidentally, um, this is partly why you want to log far more data than you send mm -hmm. down. This was the first, you did the first flight of Ebox 4, which spat out GPS results at 4 hertz and logged it all on board, which means you see all this. If you're just sending a GPS position every 10 seconds, you won't see any of this. Um, so it's quite a good idea to log it. You can see it's definitely coning all the way down. And we've probably, you've probably all seen videos of this scent where every, the whole universe is spinning around badly because the whole parachute payload system is doing that. This is avoidable. It's just because you're picking the wrong parachutes. Um, so that's, that's, one, that's one sort of, not failure mode, but bad, bad design characteristic about parachutes. Probably more pernicious for HAB is this one, which is where the parachute finds a stable position, but the stable position is cocked over to one side, and most of the vortex shedding and flow comes out of one side. And what that means is the parachute is no longer going down, it's going across as well as down. It's gliding. Um, and gliding parachutes are extremely bad for ballooning. Why? Well... You've probably already worked it out, but let's say, you know, we've all seen this kind of thing we saw this morning. Here's where you burst. Here's where the landing predictor thinks it's going to land, assuming you don't have a glidey parachute. But if you do have a glidey parachute, which could be doing, like, one-to-one -one glide is not unreasonable for a lot of these parachutes that you get from rocket shops and stuff. Um, you could land anywhere in there. And, and that means that you, people, you sort of fall out of the habit of, of thinking that the predictor is that reliable, when the predictor actually is pretty good, as I'll show you later, but you have to sort of give it a good number for the drag coefficient. You have to design a parachute system that you know is stable and will glide. Um, so yeah, it's real trouble if you have a parachute gliding. I'm sure it happens a lot. So what's the answer to uh, stopping gliding? It's porosity. Um, basically, if you can distribute a whole load of porosity among your parachute, then this high pressure to low pressure transition can happen in a much more distributed way and leave a much more uniform wake field behind the parachute that is not implying forces or torques back on the system. Um, can you get parachutes that look like that? Yes, you certainly can. This is one of ours. Um, this was that, um, an early development test for that parachute testing for Mars drop vehicle thing we did that I did a talk on a couple of years ago. But you can see this, is a, this kind of parachute is called a ring slot because it's rings and slots. Um, all the way down. And it, it, it's a really good parachute, and it, it doesn't glide. And I can, I can show you this fun thing from one of, uh, another development flight from this. We, this flight had an uplink. So this was before the days of the real-time live predictor, but we had a predictor on the laptop in the chase car. And once we got to the target altitude of about 30 kilometers, we uplinked the command saying, um, cut down now. And then we ran a prediction at when it was at 30 kilometers after it had radioed, say, I've cut down. Um, just to see where we thought it would land after the cut down, and then we could just drive off to the landing spot. And so the next picture I show you is the zoomed in on the very end of that original landing prediction. I kept the KML file. And that's this blue thing coming in here. This goes all the way off here up to sort of 30 kilometers, but this is zoomed in on the final kilometer. That was the flight prediction from 30 kilometers altitude and about 40 kilometers of the ground of where it would land, and that's where it did land. So, I mean, the weather forecast data is extremely good. People don't realize it's, it's, it's very accurate. Um, and, you know, it's, sort of, it's a shame to not take advantage of that by having parachutes that could glide in any particular random direction. They don't tend to glide with the wind or over the wind. They don't really know what direction the wind is globally going in. They just have an airspeed within the wind that's, that's fairly random. And it just makes it very uncertain about where you should go. Um, ring, finding ring slots is quite hard. Um, it would be very nice if there was like a cheap way of making ring slots, but you can imagine they're quite expensive to make because they have to be quite accurate. But you can get on the surplus market. I mean, you can get ring slots on aerospace surplus markets, but much more available. There's a company called Aerocon Systems in the States. Mm. Um, they do things like this guide sail parachute. Um, uh, sorry, ribless glide surface parachute, which is quite nice. I flew one of them on over A18. This is, that's an over 18 there. But the only thing is they're actually quite big, the one they sell. They sort of found some stash of a 10,000 from the US military. And so this was like a sort of three or four kilogram total train of payloads. It's probably bigger than you want. There's one payload there, and there's another payload beneath it, another payload beneath it. 
it's bigger than you'd want in a typical HAL flight, but they don't glide that design, so if you do find them in surplus. Um, but smaller, that, that would be a good contender. Um, but there is actually a right answer to this problem, I think, um, which is both cheap and or easy to make and doesn't oscillate and doesn't glide. And that is the venerable cross-form. Um, this is, again, from one of that test vehicle thing we did. Um, cross-forms basically are the ideal parachute for having. They have one annoying property, which is that they can start to rotate on the spot because if you can imagine the, the, the arms, they just sort of cock slightly in helicopter. That can actually be solved if you put in some restraining things around the skirt, which stops the arms deforming. And that way, they just come down very predictably and um, very smoothly, and it's quite easy to calculate what the CD value is. For almost any parachute, it's between 0.65 and 0.75. If people are selling you as one or two, they're lying or confused. In fact, the reason people often say it's one or two is because they don't realize their parachutes are gliding. So they are just measuring the... Ver uh, if I go back to... Um, if I go back to... That people are calculating the CED value just from looking at the vertical component of the airspeed, whereas actually the airspeed has got a big horizontal component as well. So that's what gives you the inflated value for CD, but it just it hides the fact that it's actually a glider <coughs> rather than a parachute. Um, so yeah, I think Crossform is probably the one to make, and I've done a very good technical drawing here for you, which I think is the ideal parachute for HAB. So it's two rectangles of um, material crossed over. This is the length. The width, you want to be about 3.6 times less than the length. That's about the right balance of stability and drag. This is what the coefficient of drag will be. That's how you calculate the area. This is how long 1.6 times the length the things want to be, and you want to put some supporting spars in. And if you want to do good, accurate HAB landings, that's the parachute I think you want to make. That's yeah. the end of my talk. <laughs> Any questions? You built one. Pardon? You ever built one? Uh, we modified that one a bit. Yeah. First, yeah. Okay. It wor works really well. Okay. Might sell them. Get them yeah. built on the sell them. Yeah, do it. I think that would solve the problem. Mind. No, no, go for it. Yeah. We'll take a picture of it now before he makes them. <laughs> Question. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yes, Fen. Could you upload the, your last drawing to the UKS? This one, yes. Yep, I could put it on right now. Any other questions? Yeah. How does it affect terminal velocity using the shape like that compared to a traditional canopy shape? Uh, well, the terminal velocity is um, this. I mean, the terminal velocity depends on your altitude, but I normally assume sea level because we say five meters per second at sea level. So that's the terminal velocity when the thing's in equilibrium. And that drawing at the end, I've given you how to calculate A and what the CD is, and the rest is your payload weight, gravity, and air density. Um, what ridiculous would you say that? Well, compared to what? Compared to assuming normal... Yeah, I mean, compared to a canopy of diameter L, this is reduced A. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the weight of material you're flying mm -hmm. will be the same. It's the same surface area. I mean, you could get, a, you could get, it would be a larger diameter for a given surface area and therefore a given weight of parachute. Um, but it wouldn't be any more weight. There wouldn't be any more weight, no, yeah, no. just a sort of a different way of distributing that, that surface area, if you see what I mean. Why didn't they use that on the Mars? Oh, um, well, because um, when you're a space agency, you can afford them. <laughs> 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 there's also, actually, I mean, I'm simplifying, there's a whole world of science, the parachutes, in terms of how they perform at different Mach numbers and different... Um, different mass ratios, which is the mass of the kind of air entrained by the canopy versus the mass of the system, and therefore how quickly they decelerate, and blah, 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 blah. And there are people whose careers it is, or, you know, to, and that was some of the work we were doing, was actually looking at the deployment, because deployment loads are actually higher than the equivalent equilibrium load at that speed. Um, so that's one of the important, that's, that's the peak thing you have to stress your design for when, say, you're designing a Mars entry lander. But as I say, that's all in that talk I gave in 2011. I go into this kind of stuff. Any more? What do you think of the rocket man parachutes? I'm finished now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, so, I should say, sometimes you see parachutes with just like a spill hole in the top and the rest solid. That doesn't cut it. That's a sticking plaster on the thing. Yeah. You want your porosity distributed, ideally, of which the cross forms a good approximation. Um, so the rocket man's are sort of like a cross yeah, form, but, but yeah, not. The, yeah, exactly. They've got they holes got inside to get the air out. 
yeah. But I think they, I think they've got they're much too fat in the middle and not enough. Yeah, distributed and not enough overall porosity. If you're building one of these from scratch, you want about 20% geometric porosity. That's about the right number. Um, as a function of the surface area, about 20% of it should be gaps. And I think the Rocket Man ones aren't enough. Mm -hmm. the material, yes, porosity. yes. Um, that's an alternative I should have mentioned. You can go for porous materials. Everyone nowadays just tends to go for ripstop and island, which is basically completely porous. but you can go for porous materials as well. And that, that, help, that will help with this if you can find a bit. Oh, it's being missold. Mis yeah. Right, okay. Well, you might get lucky with a dodgy batch then. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I did when I was building the, the Robolo glider that had a poor glide ratio. Yes. Specifically because the nylon was quite poor. You don't want prosty in a glider, no. You built the, the same wing with uh, polythene as opposed to nylon. The glide ratio went from 3.6 to about 4.4, simply because there was much better porosity in the nylon. So it's, it does seem to be quite significant. Yeah. It is. There's actually, I mean, if you want to read much more about this, there's a sort of Bible which is called uh, Parachute Recovery Systems Technical Manual by C.O. Kanaka. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that, that still actually gets confused about the CD value of gliding versus falling, but provided you know that, the rest of the information in there is really good and it's really well referenced. So that, that's the book to go for if you want to read more about this. So I guess it's not, uh, not such a long uh, stretch of imagination to go from a mesh parachute. Yeah, yeah, I guess they're just sort of rigid versions of the same thing. Just drag, yeah, drag control. Yeah. The interesting thing is if, uh, if you take a conventional parachute, you can slash them. Draw, yeah. You slash some holes in, in, into it. And obviously everyone's worry would be you put too many holes in, but because the drag goes at the velocity squared, that actually becomes quite self-correcting. Yes. The parachute can actually inflate. We're lucky because these are pre-deployed in balloons, so we don't have to do any of the engineering challenges normally associated with that peak inflation force, which can be... 1.5 to 1.6 times higher than the equilibrium force at that velocity. We, that's not a problem for us. So you could probably just, you know, you could just put a sheet down and kind of laser cut the gaps out of it, and that might not be that strong. You'd want, I mean, if you're making something for, that was going to deploy, you'd want to line all the edges yeah. with something stronger. But for this, you could probably get away with it. <laughs> I'd rather you do it. I mean, but, yeah. <laughs> you try. Yeah.